everyone, and thank you very much for coming. You'll notice there's one empty chair at the end there. I won't tell you which chambers were supposed to be there. I did want to get a nice sculpture put there, but we've not been able to arrange that at such short notice. Um, so I'm a junior tenant at Blackstone Chambers. Um, we've been given a crib sheet to stop us going too far off piste. And the first question is why you chose the bar? Well, I've been drawn to the bar for a long time, and it's partly because whenever I did work experience with barristers, they always gave me free food. Um, and I thought that was the best thing that had ever happened to me. My first mini pupillage was at a commercial set. Someone got me a muffin from Patisserie Valerie. I thought, how could things ever get better? And then I went to Blackstone for a mini pupillage, and someone bought me a burrito. It was spicier and therefore tastier, and for that reason and others, I knew that Blackstone was the place for me. I'm not going to say more about why I became a barrister in general, because I'm sure you'll all know about the various things that make the bar a great career. Um, it's very interesting, often fast-paced, you get a lot of independence. That's all great, but it's not specific to commercial law. So what I had in mind was to go through three specific and distinctive features of commercial cases, which I like and which I think make it a great area to practice in. So the first one is the significant international element in a lot of commercial cases. The second is the emphasis on teamwork in possibly slightly larger teams and over slightly longer periods than you might find in other kinds of case. And the third one is that there's some quite interesting and quirky areas of law that come up in commercial cases, and in particular in fraud cases. And I should mention that there's going to be a bit of a fraud focus um, in what I talk about because civil fraud is the area that I've ended up working in the most recently. So those are the three things I'm going to run through over the next couple of minutes. So the first one then, the international element of lots of commercial cases. The way it's sometimes described in reported judgments is that fraud knows no national bounds. And as fraud has become more sophisticated and spans across different jurisdictions, so too the courts have had to develop the law in lots of areas to cope with that kind of sophistication. And what that means is you're often dealing with Hey. Sorry. Hey, no worries. <laughs> Too busy nattering. I'm very glad we've got... Adam Constable from uh, Kitchen Chambers. Hi, Hi. afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We've got a full house. Fantastic. Um, as I was saying, B, you're often dealing with a chain of disputed transactions which happened all over the world, and the people involved can also be distributed all over the world. And that international element makes it a really interesting area to work in and throws up some interesting issues. Um, one example case I was junior counsel for the claimant and we got the judgment last year I think. The underlying dispute was about a Ukrainian television station and the ownership of that TV station. There had actually been previous proceedings in New York dealing with that issue and what we were doing was effectively bringing a kind of follow-on damages type claim in England based on the findings that have been made in New York about events going on in the Ukraine. So you can see there the way that it can you know, involve lots of different jurisdictions so first question, is England an appropriate place where you can bring a case that's got that many foreign elements? The defendant said no, we said yes, we had a hearing all about that, that was stage one. Next question, uh, are findings which are made by a New York court binding on parties to English proceedings? Again, the defendant said no, we said yes, we had another hearing all about that. And then thirdly and finally, we got on to the substance of the case, which was a, an English statutory claim what's called a transactions defrauding creditors claim. And so even at that point, we had a lot of issues raising this kind of international question, because can you apply this English statute extraterritorially? Is it an appropriate case to do so? Again, we had arguments all about that. So you can see at each of those three stages, there was this big international element, and we had some quite interesting arguments about it. Um, if I could carry on using unnecessary food metaphors, you could say it was a three-course meal, with each course having a very strong international flavour. <laughs> Another aspect of this international um, element of commercial work is that it's not just the facts that can go on all around the world. You can actually end up going to other jurisdictions to argue cases. I'm currently involved in a case that's going on in the British Virgin Islands, and so whenever there's a big hearing, we'll go out and we'll present the case there. Um, and, you know, there's lots of offshore um, centres where there's large-scale commercial litigation going on, much in the same way that it would here. And so it's an area where you can often have the chance to travel, if that's something that appeals to you. And in fact, the way that their courts are set up 
you've got the BVI courts, and that sits in the British Virgin Islands. Their court of appeal covers the whole of the Eastern Caribbean, so if you're doing an appeal hearing, you could end up in anywhere in the Eastern Caribbean. And in fact, if you go up again, then you can even end up in, back in England in the Privy Council, because that's their kind of apex court of appeal. And we ended up there earlier this year for an expedited appeal. So all of those, I hope, are just some potted examples of how if you end up doing commercial work, it has this international flavour and that can throw up some really interesting things, which makes it a nice area to work in. The second topic then I was going to talk about is the emphasis on teamwork in commercial cases. Now, obviously, in lots of different areas, you will end up working in quite small teams. You know, you might have a leader, you'll be working with solicitors. But the scale of some of these commercial cases means that you'll end up potentially working in bigger teams and for longer than would be typical in, in other areas. You know, in a big commercial case, perhaps a minimum three barristers, potentially more, and, um, and a big team of solicitors. And so if you like working with other people, that's, that's quite nice because you, know, you really get to know people over a, a longer period because you're all working together and mucking in um, to try and get what is quite a big task done. And one thing that's particularly nice about that as a junior is it's a fantastic opportunity to learn because... Um, You'd be amazed at all the different ways you can look at a single set of facts. The way that things come at you, they're not presented like an exam problem where you just get to look at the law of contract and apply the law of contract and then everyone's happy. Um, you know, your best point might be nothing to do with the law of contract. It could be a completely different claim or it could be something in the law of evidence or it could be something about conflict of laws. It could be anything. And so any two people looking at the same messy package of facts that, that you're presented with could come up with something different. And by working in a slightly larger team and getting the chance to discuss it with all these people, it's fascinating to see what other people come up with because, as I say, different people can have very interesting ideas. And I'm constantly um, you know, inspired, really, by the people that I get to work with. So I'm, I'm very grateful to get to do that. Um, so as I say, that's, if you like that kind of thing, working in bigger teams, um, that can be great. One slight health warning on that, I suppose. Um, <coughs> it's nice to be able to do other smaller things on your own as well and to get advocacy experience that way. I know that I think Advocate, the pro bono charity, has a stand at the fair somewhere. I'd, I'd recommend checking that out because that's a great way of getting experience um, you know, on your feet, on your own. And obviously there's lots of others. Maybe we'll pick them up in questions. But that was the second topic, teamwork. And then thirdly and finally, um, there are some quite interesting areas of law that come up in commercial cases, and in particular in fraud cases, that might be a bit different from the ones that form the core of what you would have been studying if you'd done law at university or um, on the GDL. Um, for example, I mean, we've already talked a bit about the conflict of laws and how there's all these um, issues that can come up about whether you can hear cases in England, what's the law that governs them, all that kind of thing. Um, but also, you know, for example, there's what's pretty common to come up with these cases on the economic torts, things like conspiracy, causing loss by unlawful means. And what's a bit odd is that there's a lot of very old school common law cases about opera singers and people going on strike, and it's really the product of those cases which are over 100 years old, which are still litigated today in a very different context um, in civil fraud cases. So I don't think the economic torts generally form that big a part of tort when you're learning it, but there is an interesting area, and there's still lots of unresolved questions that people end up arguing about there. A pet favourite of mine, um, the law of restitution. If you're doing a fraud case, quite often someone's been induced to make some payments or to transfer some property. And so you've got all kinds of questions about um, whether they can get their money back, whether they can get their property back. And that's, if you ever get a chance to dig into it, it's a fascinating area to, to work in. Um, and equally, there's all kinds of questions about constructive trusts and whether you can make a proprietary claim, which can end up being very important in, um, in fraud cases to see whether you're actually going to have an effective remedy. Um, I mean, that's just a very quick canter through some of them. I think on a Saturday morning, probably anything more than that might be a bit too intense. And frankly, off the top of my head, I'm not sure I'd give you anything useful. But I mean, if you want to have a look at any of those things, um, you'll, you can find some recent cases which will go through a lot of those things, any recent fraud case. And you'll get a taste of some of those, um, those interesting issues that can come up. So I think that's probably enough from me. That's three uh, particular things about commercial cases and fraud cases, which I think are really interesting and make it a great area to work in. OK. Um... Thank you. My name is Rachel Sandy. I'm a junior tenant at Henderson Chambers. Uh, what I would like to do is just give you a really brief intro to Chambers and uh, my practice. And then I want to talk about the four things 
that I think you need if you want to practice in commercial law. Um, so uh, Chambers, first of all, what do we do? Um, essentially, we specialise in post-disaster litigation. Historically, what that, that's meant is that we do um, defendant work, mostly for FTSE 100 companies in areas like product liability, uh, health and safety, and group actions. Increasingly, we are doing more and more claimant work as well because the way funding has changed, and so claimant group actions are now able to be funded by way of funders, and so we're getting involved in that as well. So some of the things we're doing at the moment, uh, the Volkswagen emissions litigation, that's going to trial on Monday. Um, so if I'm a bit uh, jittery, that's because I've got lots of work to do when I finish here. Um, Siroxat, we've been in as well. Grenfell Tower, we're involved in that. A lot of members of chambers are in, in council to the inquiry in that. Uh, and we've been involved on the post office litigation as well. I don't know if you've read about that. There's been some quite bruising judgments in that recently. Um, so that's chambers generally. And within that umbrella, what I do is commercial insurance and products. So the commercial work that I do is um, pretty standard contract disputes, partnerships, joint ventures, shareholder disputes, a lot of supply chain issues. Um, but that commercial work is always viewed through the prism of the broader work that we do in Chambers. Um, what that means is that we're able to service our business clients in respect to all sorts of different things that might arise out of um, a particular issue. So for example, um, if there's been some kind of incident, for example, like Grenfell, you might be looking at an inquiry, you might be looking at an inquest, you might be looking at health and safety prosecutions, and you might be looking at some civil liability claims, either um, brought by individuals or as between companies to apportion liability. Um, and in Chambers, we're able to look at and consider all of those different things. So the commercial work that I do sort of slots into that framework. Um, that's uh, a very uh, brief introduction to Chambers and me. Um, what do you need to be a commercial practitioner? There are four things. Um, the first thing is you need stamina. It is gruelling. It can be very technically challenging subject matter. Um, Ajay touched on some of the more esoteric areas that you can sort of find yourself wandering into. Uh, for example, recently I have become quite well versed in how um, the internal workings of a diesel engine operate. Um, and uh, that can be quite uh, a challenge to pick up those sort of very technical concepts very quickly and immerse yourself in the detail of that sort of work um, as quickly as you can. For me personally, it suits me quite well because my route to law was a little bit um, peculiar. I worked at first in uh, advertising and marketing and I found that I was also always leaving or being sacked from all my jobs. Um, and I realised that it's because actually I was just really, really bored in those jobs. And so I caused an awful lot of trouble. Um, and I thought I'd better go and do something that keeps me occupied and out of trouble and uh, which is sufficiently challenging and uh, safe to say that is what I found. But it did work and I have managed to keep myself out of trouble, which is good. Um, so it's the, the sort of technicality of the subject matter is a challenge. The quantity of work that you do is a challenge. Um, one case that I did a few years ago made me work probably 6 a.m. till 2 a.m. every day for about six months. It, it's it's not always like that. That's probably the sort of high watermark of, of where I was at. But that was a very, very gruelling and challenging case. And you have to be prepared, I think, to to pull some all nighters or to do work some long hours like that. Um, the quantity of work also means you need to be very organised, you need to be a good project manager, you need to be able to keep lots of plates spinning at the same time. Um, and as Ajay touched on as well, you tend to be led more, I would say, in commercial cases because you tend to work in those bigger teams of barristers or in a big team of solicitors and barristers. And so you need to have the qualities that make you a good junior. So that is being able to be responsive and turn work around quickly and try and uh, anticipate the things that your leaders are going to ask for before they ask for them. Um, so that's stamina, that's number one. Number two, you need to be able to provide a commercial service. That means pragmatic advice quickly. Your clients, if you're working for FTSE 100 companies, 
uh, your the GCs of those companies will have to report to their board once a week or once a month or how, whenever it is. And they will need to be able to go back to their board and give them a sort of headline summary of what's going on in this litigation. And you need to give them the tools with which to do that and give the board the information they need. Um, to be able to give them that pragmatic advice, you need to be able to understand the wider context, not only of the litigation, but also of their business needs more generally. So one example is if you are doing a, an isolated piece of litigation with the company and you think that's a piece of litigation, you can win. But in the course of running that litigation, you're going to have to disclose lots of documents which potentially are going to make problems for your business because they are going to cause an issue in some other business area for them, which may then give rise to its own uh, significant piece of litigation. You need to think about whether or not you're going to try and settle that first case, even though you can win it, to prevent those documents being disclosed and to prevent that issue coming out into the into the wider public sphere. So those are the sorts of issues you've got to think about. It goes beyond the particular case that you're doing. Um, and what that means is to be able to understand their business needs, you have to work quite closely with your clients and utilise their expertise in their specific areas of business. Um, that feeds into uh, thing number three that you need, which is to be strategic. <coughs> I think all litigation, but particularly commercial litigation, is a series of chess moves or strategic steps that you utilise one step at a time to get your client to the position that suits it the best, that is, gives it the best outcome. Um, so, for example, if, in the, in the example I just gave, if you do end up wanting to settle, you need to understand how to apply pressure and in what areas to get the outcome that you need. And that is... Um, uh, that involves taking account of those business issues, the business um, needs, which I spoke about earlier, but also understanding the um, procedural tools that you've got at your disposal using bits of the CPR and so on to apply pressures in different areas. Very often, the strategies that you employ in commercial cases are pretty combative and they can be quite bruising. Uh, and as also as the only woman on the panel, I have to mention this, um, it's a pretty male-dominated area of law. There is a statistic that I think something like 12% of advocates in the commercial court are women, um, which is pretty depressing. Although the juniors are doing better than the silks, 9% of those are junior women. There's 3% of advocates in the commercial court are female silks. Um, so we need some more of you. Please, wherever you are, wherever you're hiding, come join us. Um, but because that strategy, it can often be combative, uh, you need to be pretty resilient and you need to be able to take um, the battle wounds that you're going to get from those those encounters with your opponents and uh, with commercial court judges who will be scrutinising your every move. Um, and finally, you need to be details focused. Um, a lot of commercial cases um, at their heart will be about contracts or uh, contractual arrangements of some kind or another. And your uh, success or failure will often turn on a very niche and narrow point of construction. So you need to be a grammar pedant. You need to care about commas and apostrophes and all that sort of thing. Um, and you are need to going to like reading because you're going to be doing an awful lot of it. There is a huge amount of paper to get through often in these cases. Um, you need to be able to assimilate and digest all of that information and all of that documentation and be the person who knows the documents really really well actually in a commercial case um, you're often led by people who are incredibly incredibly bright and talented and all the rest of it and you feel as a commercial junior like perhaps there's not a huge amount that you can add to their expertise one thing you can add that is really really helpful is knowing the documents inside out back to front um, so you need to be on top of all of the details in those documents. Um, those are the, the four things that I just wanted to run through. Uh, my sort of summary of commercial work is I would say it is at times it is incredibly tough, but it is fantastically rewarding. And I would highly uh, recommend that you all uh, come and do it. Um, now I'll hand over, but there'll be questions at the end. Thank you. Um... <clears throat> So uh, I'm Adam Constable QC, I'm at Keating Chambers, which is a specialist commercial set uh, specialising, um, its brand I suppose specialises in construction law, but what um, I want to say a few things about is 
um, not specific to that, but specific to being or thinking about a specialist set within the commercial law sphere. Um, because there are a, a number of specialist sets either similar to Keating or specialising other little pockets of the commercial law. And why, why would you think about that sort of set? And that's the sort of question that I want to spend a few minutes helping you answer. Um, so, so first of all, is a specialist set a specialist set? Um, no, is the answer. Um, I do cases against people at Brick Court, at Essex Court, at Fountain Court, uh, at Henderson, at Blackstone. Um, and um, we might call our cases different sort of cases. So what might be called an energy case if you're at, at Brick Court or, or at 7KBW is a construction case for us. What is a professional negligence case if you're at 4 New Square is a construction case for us. Um, you know, what is uh, a, a procurement case? Um, well, it's just another facet of the construction industry for, for us. Uh, shipboarding, if you're at 20 Essex Street, you'll do a lot of shipbuilding. We do loads of shipbuilding. We've written a textbook on shipbuilding. Um, so, so whilst specialist sets have a, have a sort of uh, a mystique about them, they, they really aren't, they're just commercial sets and they actually generally tend to do nowadays a broad range of commercial work, although it is quite often pigeonholed through a certain lens, which is a sort of historical lens. Um, certainly Keating's background was in construction, which is why we're thought of as the bricky set, but we do, we do sort of a lot more than is on the tin. And I know a lot of the other supposedly specialist sets really um, have a range of work as well. So when you are looking at commercial sets, obviously, you know, you're going to look at the sets that do the broad range of commercial work, but don't um, dismiss the more specialist ones. Look at them in detail about what they actually do. And I think you will find that although they come at things from a certain angle, they generally have a much broader uh, range of work than you might, you know, you might at first imagine. Why would you look at any particular specialism within the commercial bar? Um, well, you wouldn't. Um, when I was 20, did I think I was going to be a construction silk and spend my days doing that? Of course I didn't. I didn't have a, didn't have a clue about what, what that area of law was. And if I'm entirely honest, if we have a, a pupil prospective pupil in front of us who hasn't got any particular reason why they would be focused on it. For example, with us, you know, they've got an engineering background or whatever it might be, but they're just, they've just got a general, a general background and they say all they want to do in the world is construction law. We won't believe them because it's, it would be entirely mad to, to, to want to do that when you're 20. Um, what happens in life, which is absolutely great, is you end up doing what is thrown at you. And um, I, in fact, started off a generalist set and moved after a number of years to a more specialist one because I kind of ended up doing that. But you, I'm sure, weren't thinking that you would be a specialist in diesel engines. I was um, not. A, a, a year ago. And that's, what, and that's what you end up doing. And I suspect you'll end up getting a whole bunch of motor cases now because that's, that's kind of what happens. You, you get to know the solicitors, you get to know the area, you get a reputation in a certain thing and the practice comes to you rather than necessarily you going out and getting it. So don't have a fixed idea, I suppose is the advice, about what you really want to do. Um, or don't be worried if you don't have a fixed idea about what you really want to do, because that's one of the great things about the bar and about the commercial bar, is that you see a whole range of things and you end up doing stuff that you really didn't dream you'd ever up doing and becoming knowledgeable in, and becoming an expert in. And the work finds you when you're a good set and you just don't have to worry about it. So don't, don't pretend to yourself that you have an absolutely fixed goal about doing a particular thing. You probably won't end up doing it even if you do have that idea. And it's be entirely relaxed about not knowing really what course your life at the bar is necessarily going to take. Um, I think you need to make big decisions about commercial versus criminal or criminal versus family. Um, but other than that, I think if you decided that you want commercial law, it's a massive field. You will find 
lots of things to do that will be interesting and as I say the interesting things will find you and you'll end up doing a whole whole different range of, of, of things um, so uh, don't worry too much about specialist sets um, choosing them particularly just go across the full range why why the commercial bar at all well I think a lot of it has already been said but um, it is massively rewarding intellectually and factually are the two are the two big things um, your brain is going all the time uh, it can be a bit annoying sometimes but um, you're thinking about stuff all of the time and you don't ever get bored intellectually w which is great I've just had a week finished last night um, uh, in front of uh, Lord Hoffman sitting as an arbitrator um, trying to persuade him what a contract means uh, it's great I mean it's just great fun you wake up in the morning and you know that you're gonna spend three hours discussing something with Lord Hoffman about about what the contract means and he's got a different idea about it and you you, you slowly win him round on some points and you uh, you know from minute one you're not going to win on other ones and then you change the the the, the approach slightly to emphasize this and that where where you where you think you're going to get but I mean what a what a brilliant fun job you know you're sitting there with with you know this guy who's written some of the greatest judgments and and he's talking with you discussing with you to you it feels as though you're on a level playing field you clearly are not um he's about 100 yards ahead um and um but but nevertheless it's brilliantly intellectually satisfying um but it's not very often about the contract you know, it, there's there's going to be these bits. There are going to be these three hours when you're discussing with Lord Hoffman about what the contract means. But I spent the previous three days before yesterday in the same arbitration cross-examining engineers about uh, the technical aspects of a power plant and why certain things could or could not um, be done in the context of the um, uh, referendum in northern, northern Iraq um, where the Kurdistan government declared um, independence and how the potential force majeure uh, and the security aspects of that impacted on the work that was going on at the power plant. Um, that was all about factual stuff. It was all about documents. It was all about finding out really what happened. And ultimately, it was all about cross-examining someone who was lying through his teeth. And it was great fun to demonstrate that over a period of six hours and you take it slowly, slowly, slowly through the documents. And it doesn't really matter what they say because you've laid the trail in the documents, the tribunal is following it all, and even if they don't agree with your last question, it really doesn't matter because you've made the point through the documents, the tribunal understand it, and either they agree with you, brilliant, or they don't and they look as though they're a liar. So either way you win. Um, and that, that is the factually interesting um, stuff. You know, you roll your sleeves up, you, you get stuck in, and you have great fun cross-examining uh, factual witnesses. And I suppose the third point is the experts. At the commercial <coughs> bar, you do a lot of work with experts, which is um, just amazing fun again. You don't know about a particular sort of widget, the whole case is about this particular sort of widget and you have Mr. or Mrs. Widget come in and, and sit down with you for three days and tell you everything about the widget. And then you cross-examine someone who thinks they know about the widget and you know more than them about the widget. It's brilliant. It's such fun. Um, so so um, it's, the law is great, the facts are great fun and, and you get to deal with experts, you get to deal with really interesting people who know an awful lot about their subject. The ones you really like are the ones on your side who tell you all the right answers, and then you get to cross-examine people on the other side who think they know all the answers. Um, it's 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 really it's really good fun. So um, it will keep you busy. Um, travel is great. There's lots of international stuff, um, which is good. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. I mean, at Keating, we have we're about 60% international work, 40% domestic now. There are some people who just do domestic stuff, there are some people who just do international stuff, and there are people that, that, that have a mix. Um, I'm in Dubai next week, I'm in Singapore the week after, I've got a five week case in Sydney in the new year. Um, so, you know, there's lots of, there's lots of travel if, if that's what you want, um, which is good. 
and the elephant in the room, um, it pays well. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's serious. That, it's, it's a serious point. Um, and it, it pays well. You just won't have to worry. The reality is you don't worry about money when you're at the commercial bar. You don't worry about the next case. Next case is always coming. Next case will always pay well. And um, and you just you don't. You, that's, it's just a part of your life that you don't have to worry about. And um, that's a serious that's a serious thing. And you can't you can't say that about the criminal bar. Um, I sit as a as a recorder in the Crown Court. Um, uh, I have a lot of. Uh, uh, and through that, I know, and, and I do a lot of advocacy stuff at Inner Temple, and a lot of my colleagues in that are criminal practitioners, and they have a really, really hard time. Um, I take my hat off to anyone that goes to the criminal bar. I think it's an amazing job, um, and we need, we need lots of people at the criminal bar. We need people to do it. Um, but you've got to decide if that's, if that's the life for you because it's a very, very different job. I mean, they are very, very different jobs being at the criminal bar to being at the commercial bar. And the big driver for the difference didn't used to be it 25 years ago. Didn't, there wasn't that difference. You could be a criminal barrister and a commercial barrister and you would earn basically the same. Um, it is a massive difference. And you've got to decide and you've got to be realistic about what you want. And if you want to go down that route, absolutely brilliant, as I say. The country needs it, and you will have great fun being a criminal uh, advocate. But the financial toll it will take is is a, is is um, it's not easy. It's not easy, and you don't have any of those worries when you're at the commercial bar. So um, that's that shouldn't be the driving reason why you do it. But uh, it, that's the truth. So I mean, it's it's, it's part of it. So, Ajay and Adam both mentioned the international dimension of the commercial bar, which is, I'm sure, very appealing to a lot of people in this room. Uh, is it worthwhile to get dual qualified in another Commonwealth jurisdiction or in the States? I, I don't mind kicking off on that one. I can say, personally, the way that it worked for me was that I got called to the bar in the BBI for the purpose of this case that I once I started doing it, so I didn't need to do any prior qualifications. I know that it works differently in other jurisdictions. Um, I can't say that I've done it myself, um, but I know people who have and have found it very useful, and it's opened up new areas for them. Um, so I think if, you know, if you've got the time and it's an interest of yours, then I certainly wouldn't say no to it, but I can't say that I've, I've got personal experience of it. I, I, yeah, I think that's about the right answer. Do it if you, if, if you want to, but it's definitely not, it's definitely not a ne necessity if you travel and you need and you need to be um, called to the bar of a particular bar, you tend to get called for the purposes of of, of, of that case. Um, so do it for the fun if you want to, but don't feel you need to. Um, you've just said something that, that triggered this. Is it, this is off the cuff. I'm not even sure I should be asking this. You've just mentioned that you know the criminal bar is tough, and that's largely because of where the funding comes from for defence work. And I've read the the, uh, the secret barrister, which is everyone ought to read whether they're doing mm. criminal or not, yeah. but especially if they're going to do criminal. My question is, what are the moral or ethical issues of finding a pupillage in an area which is not your primary interest, because you're more likely to find pupillage in that area, and then move across after? The um, c yeah, can I, can I answer that? I, th I think, um, well, I'll, I'll have a stab and then uh, if anybody can jump in. I, I think if, you know, if that's what you want to do, then it is up to you. But there are two things that I would say about it. The first thing I would say is that pupillage is an investment by Chambers in you and particularly a pupillage from I don't I don't know what, what these guys awards are our pupillage award is 70,000 so it's near the top of of what you can get and it's an enormous investment by all of us in you because we see something in you that we think has a, a huge amount of potential and we want to help you realize that potential um, and knowing I, I've known a couple of people at different sets who've taken that course and the process of divorcing from their prior set has been a very difficult and challenging and emotional one, both for them and for that set. 
And I think if, you know, if that's what you plan to do from the outset, maybe you would find it easier. I don't know. But I wouldn't underestimate the serious, um, the seriousness of making that move. Um, that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that it's very difficult because of because there are areas of this work that are so challenging in different ways. Um, it's very difficult to be good at this job if your heart isn't really in it because you want to be doing something different. And I think um, ultimately my sense is that it often it would show through at interview that in fact your heart is somewhere else. Um, and so I would just bear those things in mind. It's not, for me personally, it's not a course that I would recommend. I'm sure other people have different views. I don't know if these guys want to jump in. But. I just wanted to echo the second of those points, which I do think hands down the most important thing is to be interested and enthusiastic about what you're doing. And if, you, if you've got that, then everything else will, will fall into place. So I think, you know, I'm not saying anything absolute, but I do think there's a real, a real value in getting involved in something that you can throw yourself into and really enjoy because you'll, you'll do better, I think. Yeah, I would say something absolutely don't do it. It's crazy, absolutely crazy. You, because you, it won't succeed either, because um, uh, you can't just move, you can't just move chambers to a chambers that you want to move to. <laughs> chambers have to want you. And um, why, why would a, uh, a, a top commercial set, what the, a top commercial set will only take someone else from another top commercial set who has very good reasons to move because their practice has gone in a particular direction and they are now doing more of a certain type of work or, 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 or whatever it is. You, um, the only set that will take you that don't really care about it is a set that's kind of lower down the pecking order of, of chambers. And so it, it, as a tactic, it's a bad one. I was going to ask, how do you think technology will affect your practice area? Ooh, that's, that's a big one. I mean, you know, there's, there's lots of stuff in terms of, you know, managing big commercial cases and all the documents involved. The more that can be done electronically, I think, frankly, the better. If I could um, answer a slightly different question, how will technology affect the way we work as barristers generally? I mean, I think we're starting to see um, more of a trend towards people potentially working from home or, you know, being able to access things um, electronically and work that way, which, you know, allows people to be more flexible. And I think it's generally, you know, it's positive that people should have that, that option. So I'm I'm pro technology. Yeah, I'm I'm pro printing everything out in A5 bundles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but uh, but I'm trying my best. <laughs> Being able to work from home. I mean that actually that is the that is that is the rule. I mean the real difference between now and it's been happening obviously, but the bar is a brilliant way to be able to do it because you're self-employed. You know, I've never missed a kid's... I mean, you sort of talked about the work. It is hard work. It can be gruelling. Um, but as soon as my kids came along, I said, I'm not going to work weekends. And I really, really don't work weekends. I put in about 60 to 70 hours Monday to Friday. I work really hard Monday to Friday. Um, but I just don't work the weekends. And even the weekdays, I've not missed a kid's sports day. You know, I'm there. I might be on my phone and miss them dropping the egg or something. But, <laughs> but, um, but, 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 but you can do that. You can do that. And as long as you're disciplined... You can work your own hours, you can work pretty much where you want to work, and you can, in the context of what is a very hard-working job, you have, you have much more ability, for example, as a barrister than you do as a solicitor when you're working on a case, to not be based you know, at an office, not be expected to be there at 7 o'clock, not be expected to be pouring over a photocopier at midnight. You can, you can kind of do what you want, and technology is a massive, massive part of being able to do that. So it, it has been uh, enormously liberating in the last 10 years for the bar, and being self-employed has become even more of a benefit, I think, than it would have been in the past because of the way you are then able to work on your own terms. No, I'm just, I, I'm trying to get more au fait with working online and having everything digitally, but I'm, I'm a bit like you, Adam. I just, I just like to have a copy physically in my hand. So the less said about that, the better, probably. And on that note, if you'd like to join me, thank you, Nadia.